Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this talk by Gordon Shadrach. According to his website, Anthony Gordon Shadrach is a Canadian artist and educator based in Toronto. Shadrach is known for exploring the semiotics of dress and its impact on culture, in particular, the intersection and codification of race and fashion through his painting and textile based work. And I'm actually going to put Gordon's website in the chat so you can take a look at some of his fantastic art. Gordon works in series, like sort of themed series of paintings that go in and become um, his art shows. And they are basically put together on his website there. And Gordon has just recently been collected by the Art Gallery of Hamilton. Isn't that right, Gordon? Yeah. And that was from your exhibition at United Contemporary United Gallery. United Contemporary, which yeah. is in the summer, right? Yeah. Yes. Great show. Okay. So that's Gordon's site. Um, uh, in terms of fashion, Gordon has fashion in his DNA. <laughs> <laughs> as we were both designers together at Mac Cosmetics in the 90s, um, which was probably, wouldn't you say, Gordon, pretty much the coolest design job in Canada at that point. We had the coolest design job in the world at that point. Pretty much, because we were Mac, right? Like, it, yeah. was, it was pretty amazing. Um, Gordon has since turned his art, art explorations, turned two art explorations for his creative work. Yeah. Okay, his talk today is a part of the work the Seneca Canadian Fashion Diversity Project is doing. And I'm going to put another link in the chat for that. And I'm quickly going to do a screen share. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with our Fashion Resource Center, which has been hosting the Seneca Canadian Fashion Diversity Project since last September. Okay, so the Seneca Canadian Fashion Diversity Project is a multimedia resource for education about, as well as celebration of fashion diversity. Hosted on a website supported by the Seneca Library, the Seneca Canadian Fashion Diversity Project focuses on fashion diversity research, garnered through object-based methodologies centered on garments from the Seneca Fashion Resource Collection. The Seneca Canadian Fashion Diversity Project is made possible by a grant to fund the student researchers, as well as institutional support for me, Dr. Mark Joseph O'Connell. Okay. So I am going to hand it over to you, Gordon. Um, folks, um, Gordon's gonna do his talk and then we are gonna get into the Q&A and discussion after. So as your, your comments and thoughts are coming up, put them right in the chat, and then we will address them as soon, you know, once we get into the, the talk. Okay, Gordon, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I am so excited about this. Every talk that I give is different and unique, but familiar at the same time. And so I always get a little bit nervous initially. So if I'm a little off my game, please just just enjoy the ride with me. Uh, so as Mark said, I am Gordon Shadrach. I am an artist and an educator. I am a elementary school teacher. I am currently on leave so I can focus on my painting full time. And I'm going to be talking to you about my work. And yes, Mark and I were living the crazy life of the 90s. And uh, if I could go back in time, I wouldn't change anything at all. <laughs> we had such a good time. All right, so I'm going to share my screen and we will get started into the presentation. And I will be addressing some uh, information about who I am, how I got to be the person I am today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about um, fine art. I'm going to be talking about race. I'm going to be talking about, as Mark said, codification of clothing and what it means, semiotics of clothing, and we'll get more into that as, and we'll see how it's all tied together. We'll see how, um, whether we want to or not, um, whether we want it to be or not, um, race and clothing are intertwined and in how people decide they're going to interpret how you uh, present yourself, uh, no matter what our intentions are. 
And it's something that I've lived with for a very, very long time. Uh, so I might know a little bit about this. So here we go. And there we go. So the name of the presentation is Clothing and Art, the Importance of Semiotics in Representation, uh, representation Representational Portraits. And I am, of course, Gordon Shadrach. And I'm going to do a little bit of talking about semiotics first. And so it is a fancy word. And the first time I heard it, I had no idea what it meant. Um, but I eventually uh, learned to appreciate it and uh, realize how much it's impacted my life, my entire life. So I'm just going to do the boring stuff first and read the definitions uh, as provided to me by Wikipedia. <laughs> I do not claim that I have written these definitions myself. So semiotics is the study of signs, your activities, conduct, or processes. A sign is anything that communicates something interpreted as meaning to the other people that they feel has meaning. Semiotics is frequently seen as having important anthropological and sociological dimensions. And then where I really focus on is the semiotics of dress. And semiotics of dress is a term used to refer to the design and customs associated with clothing as pattern to a kind of symbolism that has rules and norms. It is a study of how people use clothing and adornments to signify various cultural and societal positions. In other words, it's how we choose to wear what we wear every day. And um, it's interesting because uh, I know that every day I have chosen to wear joggers <laughs> for the last two and a half years, uh, but uh, this is gonna go a little bit deeper than that. Uh, so as our friend Julie Andrews once said, let's start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start. Let's see, uh, what's going on? All right, so I thought I'd start off by talking a little bit about me, by showing little me. Um, I'm obsessed with little me. <laughs> and the reason why I'm obsessed with little me is because it is shocking to me how much uh, little me uh, has informed who big me is to this day. Um, and so when we talk about the idea of semiotics of, of clothing uh, and the meaning behind it, it is something that has been um, drilled into my head since I was a child. Um, I was born in Brampton in the 60s. I'm the, child, the child of two immigrants from the Caribbean. My dad was born in Dominica, but raised in Trinidad. My mother's Trinidadian. And they came to Canada with their three sons. And then they eventually had me, so I'm the youngest. Um, and uh, if you know Brampton, it's a pretty diverse place now. But when I was born and when I grew up, um, there were very few people that looked like me. And so it was predominantly white. I was often the only black child in my class. Um, my brothers and I were, for the first couple of schools, I think usually one of the only one or two black families in our school. Um, and so this is where those lessons about the importance of dress came to me at a very young age. Um, we had, were sort of incurred, well, we were taught from a very young age that we had to, uh, that we were being watched and judged usually harsher and more hard um, than other children were. So my mother was very insistent that even though this outfit is completely questionable by today's standards, we had to dress very well um, and of course behave very well. Um, inadvertently, my mother uh, and father didn't realize, but they were putting the pressure of having, of representing the entire black culture on our shoulders, which we didn't realize at the time, it was a lot of pressure, um, but we felt like if we misbehaved or acted out in public, which wasn't an option, or we didn't look clean or put together, then every anyone who was black would be judged by what we were doing. It's not um, a very happy thing to talk about, and it, and it is very depressing, but it is the reality of the times that we were living in. Um, my parents were people who believed and were raised with the idea of dignity politics. Um, which is where, you know, if you uh, look a certain way and dress a certain way, then the expectation is that people will respect you and treat you a certain way. Um, and it was a carryover from the, um, of course, from the revolutions of the 60s and 70s, but it didn't necessarily pay off the way I think um, earlier generations would have expected it to, that despite how you present yourself, carry yourself, 
dress yourself, um, people will see your skin color first and they will, and in some cases treat you because uh, differently because of that. Um, and so my whole uh, understanding about the importance of dress really came from this idea of dignity politics, of, of really understanding that um, there were societal norms that you needed to adhere to. And, um, and in some cases, not only did you have to adhere to, you had to do it better than others in order to be accepted. And this is something that I think a lot of Black children are still being brought up with that understanding today that, that you are likely to be judged uh, again more harshly, uh, more critically, and so and you will have to work twice as hard to get to where other people are going. So um, that's a happy note to start off on, but it did teach me to look at the world critically. It did teach me how to look at um, pop culture, art, uh, and see how Black people were being represented. Uh, it taught me about the idea of stereotypes from a very young age. Um, how I presented myself usually involved a lot of white people saying, well, I didn't act Black or sound Black because their only experiences with what they saw was on TV. Um, and so I've learned that um, I think people are realizing there, there are many different ways to be Black, but especially back then, um, people really use pop culture as a way of guiding them. Um, I had very strong, uh, intelligent and caring parents um, who felt very strongly about making good choices and being respectful to who they were. I said that my parents belonged uh, to this school of digni dignity, um, you know, this idea of, of dressing with dignity, but at the same time, my dad was really, really um, proud of being able to be expressive about who he was. So when he was, both my parents were teachers, and my father at one point was, you know, being pressured by his principal to start wearing a tie to school. Um, back then, they thought if a teacher wore a tie to school, that he would be more respected. And he knew that he looked way more fly wearing his cool neckerchief. <laughs> so he fought against it. And he, even though, as I said, he wanted to do the right things, he also knew that he had to be true to himself. Um, my mother took fashion very seriously, and um, I remember very much watching her transform when she was going out for an evening or to a party with friends, and I would watch wrapped with seeing how she would apply her makeup and, and how she would get ready every day. So, you know, it really is in my DNA, and my mother actually started to trust me to dress my brother. So even though I was the youngest in the family, if we were getting ready to go to church, I had to make sure that my brother, who was two years older than me, had a, a respectable outfit on. I would choose his clothes. So I was actually styling my brother when I was like eight years old <laughs> to make sure he looked good. Um, and it's funny because, you know, of course, when you go to church, you put on your Sunday best. And I do remember as a little boy um, being looked up and down by another, uh, another boy, a white boy, when I was little. And I remember him you know, looking up and down at my clothing with a look of judgment on his face. And I remember him pausing at my shoes. And I remember him thinking, I remember thinking, why is he looking at my shoes so intensely? And it, 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 it sounds really odd, but this is something I have remembered my entire life. And I realized that, of course, you know, we know that shoes finish an outfit. <laughs> so I guess he was checking to make sure I was okay. Uh, but it's, it's, it's surprising the little things that stick in your brain. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the shoe thing in just a couple of minutes. Um, I've also taught myself how to sew in high school. My parents were very progressive and wanted me to go and study fashion. And I said, why would I go study fashion? <laughs> so I never studied fashion. Um, I eventually ended up going to Ontario College of Art back then, which is now OCADU and I studied textile design. So I learned how to uh, print fabric and work with fabrics to make sculptures as well. Um, I have worked for Harry Rosen in display, uh, Polo Ralph Lauren, and uh, I worked at Mac Cosmetics, as we said earlier with Mark, where I was essentially uh, an industrial designer. Somehow that has sort of came out of it, as well as designing clothes and fashions for special events. So I have, 
had a long involvement with fashion and it has really shaped who I am as a person. Um, it really still shapes who I am today as I seek out current fashions that a man my age can wear appropriately because <laughs> I'm still obsessed with seeing what's new. Um, and right now those high-waisted jeans are not gonna do me any favors. Um, so let's get start talking about my work. Um, so I mentioned I was sort of, I became a, um, focused on shoes at a very young age, and uh, I still have a bit of a shoe obsession now. And so when I started painting, I started painting, by the way, as a total lark. It was a hobby that started off. Um, my partner encouraged me to start painting because, uh, you know, we both have an interest in fashion. And years ago, I saw these prints of bow ties that I really, really liked. And he encouraged me to paint them instead of buying them. And so I started painting these bow ties and um, I just haven't stopped painting since. So it's eight years later and my painting has just turned into this full-time little personal industry right now. Um, so let's take a look. So when I started painting and people started becoming interested in my paintings, um, I started focusing on uh, a specific theme and I chose shoes because why not? As I said, I love shoes. And I also thought, to be quite honest, one of the reasons why I started painting shoes was because I didn't think I could paint faces. So you're talking to a portrait artist who started off by painting shoes because he didn't think he could paint faces. So I decided to paint shoes, which are actually really quite challenging. Um, and the reason why I started painting these um, was because I really enjoyed them. And then at that point in time, it was sort of on trend. There was this idea of the fun socks that everyone was wearing, a lot of the stripes. And it was kind of current at the time. And um, it was something I was personally interested in. And I realized that as I was entering art markets and going to art fairs and showing in cafes that I wanted to choose something. I was very conscious of the fact that I was choosing sort of non-representational paintings uh, of fashion. Um, these shoes, we read them as people who are probably identify as male, but these, these feet could belong to anybody. They could be belong to anyone of any gender, any, you know, any race. Um, and so they are uh, an interesting way of looking at neutrality in portraiture. We know that portraiture is a way of, of often highlighting someone and uh, aspects of them and being able to tell a story or a narrative about who they are. But in these ones, we know very little about the actual sitters, the people who are in there. We just do our interpretations from what we see and what we're given. Um, the one on the right here with the two pairs of, with, on the, with the red carpet, that one is interesting to me because when I started doing paintings like this and started getting feedback from different people at different events, they was, one person particularly started talking about how seeing these shoes actually reminded her of being a child and sitting at an adult's foot, uh, feet while they talked to them or while they played on the floor. So one of the things that when you're an artist, you start to realize that your work starts to have different meanings to different people and which is you know kind of obvious, but I think I'm always surprised at the number of interpretations or the feelings that they can evoke in different people. Um, and even the language they use to describe how they feel about these pieces um, always surprises me and I always find it enlightening. Um, but as you paint, and Mark did allude to the fact that I, I tend to do a lot of different series, I tend to also want to evolve. And I also really like to challenge myself. So a lot of the things that I ended up painting are, are all things that I said I couldn't paint before. So I'm always challenging myself. I'm always moving forward. And with this idea of doing these neutral portraits, I realized that representation was really, really important. And so I started to do different ways of sort of sliding it in and experimenting with representation. So here are two portraits of myself. Um, so one, obviously you can see the skin on my ankles. I'm not wearing socks. And the other one, I'm wearing socks. One of these portraits is more political than the other portrait. And that's where it, uh, the idea of race and style come in. Um, when I started painting these paintings, I did them because I liked them. I liked the images that I was creating. 
I liked the stories that I was coming up with. Um, but I also didn't realize that once you insert black bodies into fashion, it becomes uh, political. And so pe even though these poses are both very similar in the sense that they're, you know, someone reclining with their feet up, the fact that you can clearly see that, you know, the one with the polka dot pants is someone who is black, um, there's a different ramification, there's a different way of reading into it. Um, often people describe it as having a, 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 there's so many different pieces to it. The fact that I'm wearing these, these, you know, these uh, whiskey colored shoes that read as gold and these sort of, you know, polka dot satiny looking pants. Um, it becomes a, a situation where people are thinking someone's luxuriating. Um, it, it has a slightly different feeling and the responses to how people see it is slightly different. Um, I didn't realize how, um, political inserting black bodies into art was. I kind of entered that naively, but I did see the importance of it and the significance of it. And so I started to really explore it much more. So these are still early works. So the works that I'm showing you are, you know, from uh, about seven years ago, six or seven years ago. And these works here were reflecting a, tre a trend that was happening. Uh, it, was, it was a trend that I was picking up on Instagram. And there were a lot, there was a big movement with black men on Instagram to, to level up their style. And there were these almost like gentlemen's clubs and organizations where um, there was an encouragement of people to really start considering the choices that they make and how they present themselves again in a different, but in a different way. And I, I love these paintings because they're, they have a sense of, they're almost sensual. But I also realized that um, it was an interesting way of entering with, you know, Black people in portraiture because it was counterintuitive to how people were expecting Black people to be presented in art. Um, there are so many stereotypes with how uh, black men in particular are represented in art. And often when you look at uh, black people in art, there's a strong focus on celebrity culture. So there's a lot of rappers and a lot of basketball players and athletes. Um, and I, you know, occasionally painted the odd celebrity, but I really wanted the idea of, of elevating the average black man that we should be celebrating ourselves um, instead of always, you know, exalting those who are already elevated, um, we need to start recognizing our own excellence and, and acknowledging who we are and representing who we are, uh, as opposed to always just presenting the people who are already at the top of the top of the hill. So um, I, I ended up having a lot of conversations with people. And when I would present these at art fairs, um, that people would a lot of people were happy to see them. Black people were very happy to see them. They were happy to see themselves represented on walls and at art exhibitions. Um, but I think um, other people found them a bit challenging. And the, the challenges, <laughs> the, the conversations that I had uh, in the last few years have revealed to me that the, um, that there is a very strong disconnect between um, the openness that we would perceive of art lovers and um, what they perceive to be Canadian art. But that's a whole different presentation. Uh, but it's, it, it is surprising. So again, this is another example uh, of a portrait that I did of a friend. And it was this idea of realizing that putting a Black man in a suit was somehow revolutionary in portraiture. <laughs> um, and so the more I painted, the more I realized how narrow uh, and how limiting um, the perception of Black people are in art and culture by the larger art audience. Um, so seeing someone style like this, seeing someone with dreadlocks and a tie um, was quite surprising to a lot of people. I think people figure that if you're going to represent with some dreadlocks, they're immediately going to associate it with reggae. And this was, uh, again, about seven years ago. It, it's, a, it's a very interesting way of looking at how people have a hard time 
associating different aspects of culture and putting them together. Um, this is not shocking, and this is <laughs> by no means groundbreaking, but one of the benefits of emerging as an artist as I did, which uh, involved me going to a lot of art fairs, meant, meant that I actually engaged with a lot of, of art buyers and art collectors. And that is, was really important in shaping who I am as an artist and who I am as um, a, a, a speaker when I'm talking about art, uh, because it really let me know, um, it really gave me access to the inner workings of a lot of people's minds. And it really helped push me as an artist to keep moving forward and to keep challenging what people were expecting um, this sort of representation to look like. And one of the things that came out of all these conversations, I know that in this situation, the person is looking off, but that's an important part of what I'm going to be talking about next. And what I'm talking about next is something called the gaze. And the gaze, of course, is where the person in the painting is looking and how much that became such a challenging aspect uh, for some of the people uh, that collect art and buy art or go to art fairs and want to talk, wanted to talk to me about certain things. Um, so we're going to be looking at my next slide, which is a perfect example of gaze. And this is where it all became clear to me <laughs> that I was living in a in a world of many different standards. Um, so the painting on the left of the black man with the dreadlocks was one of my early paintings of uh, exploring uh, when I was doing all this 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 work with looking at how um, you know black men in suits or dressed a certain way was um, being represented or how it was being taken. Um, I also started to explore historical clothing. I became um, obsessed with historical clothing. There's an amazing um, collection of men's historical dress uh, from LACMA in the US called Reigning Men. If you have an opportunity to uh, have, get your hands on the book Reigning Men, it's really, really incredible. And I've learned a lot from that book. And you can, if you know the book, you'll know that clothing is taken directly from it. Um, the painting on the right is the portrait of Madame Renier by Jacques-Louis David. It was painted in 1800. So the reason why I put these two together is because the exchanges that I was having with people started to realize, I started to realize the biases that were happening um, within the art world and from art lovers. So I showed this painting at uh, the uh, Toronto International, sorry, the Toronto Outdoor Art Exhibition. And I was confronted by someone who was an, uh, uh, an art consultant who told me that my painting, Feather in the Cap, would never sell. And he said it wouldn't sell because of the sitter's gaze. He felt that the person who I was talking to was white, and he felt that the gaze of my, my the gentleman in my painting was too direct and too confrontational. And um, I'm happy to report I sold it the same day to another collector. Uh, but it, became, it made me kind of obsessed with this idea of gaze and how when we look at the whole history of subversion and the way people have tried to, to the, the idea of white supremacy and how that impacts black bodies, uh, there was an expectation where um, black men would have to look away. It would be uh, an insult or it would be dangerous for a black person to make, a black man to make eye contact with a white woman. You could be lynched for it. But I'm getting off topic. It, the, the point of this comparison that I have here is we have a white woman who's in repose and she's gazing at the viewer, but I don't think anyone would ever say she looks confrontational or <laughs> that she's coming at them. So, Again, it's this idea of projecting our biases and our, our prejudices, and it's it's done in an open way where people. This is a guy that's dressed as a dandy, and that just goes aside. Someone is just looking at a black man looking at him, and therefore, it's a negative experience for that viewer. Um, it was a very challenging time for me as an artist um, because. I of course wanted to be successful as an artist, but I and I started to realize that um, 
the things that were driving me to move forward as an artist were, were the love of what I was doing, but also I reached a point where I realized that I had to keep fighting against this, this existing, this pre-existing bias that I would never have expected existed. And so if we're looking at this as a world where it's art and we think people are going to be open-minded and it's going to be this beautiful, everyone's going to be so kind to each other, there's a duality there. There's an expectation that um, art is going to look a certain way, um, Black people are going to be presented a certain way, and these are all things that are tied in our culture, in our fashion, in everything. Um, and it has a huge impact on how uh, people are able to succeed in our in our world, in our communities. And I'm glad to see that there's been some changes, um, you know, in the last couple of years. But, you know, let's look at, let's be honest about what it took. It took a whole world watching something horrible happen before people actually started to say, you know what, maybe we need to listen a little bit more. This is another perfect example of, um, this is a painting called Present that I did. And, um, uh, you know, this is when I started really, really, you know, I just showed you a, a dandy with a, you know, dreadlocks, but the whole argument about natural hair and what that means and how that comes into play for people. This was a painting where I had a lot of conversation with it because I know in particular, there was this one woman that I had a conversation with at the Toronto Artist Project who just couldn't, the, the inaccuracy of seeing a black man with natural hair wearing this clothes, this Edwardian sort of clothing, just threw her for a loop and she just couldn't accept it. It was a white woman that just, but then black people were just embracing it and saying, it's so amazing to see that we know, of course, there were black people in North America in, you know, in the early 1900s. We know that they existed, but the whole point of this painting was to subvert the expectation of breaking free from, you know, from the oppressors. It's, it's reclaiming our own natural beauty and not trying to necessarily match the expectations of, of, of our oppressors. Um, but some people found that really, really challenging, whereas I knew there were a lot of people that just embraced it. So as an artist, I really focused on the positive um, response that I was getting, the, the positive exchanges that I was having. But the challenging and or negative conversations I had really did also push me forward. I also realized that the more I painted black men, there was a tendency for certain art goers to want to exoticize what I was doing. Um, there's an easy sort of mentality of, if I find something attractive, I'm going to exoticize it. And, make it overtly sexual um, in ways that I don't think is always used in a way that it's just, it's just not always appropriate. It isn't appropriate. We can't admire something for beautiful as beautiful, but we don't have to exoticize it and make it something more than it needs to be. So that's why I wanted to talk about this painting. So here's someone in a beautiful brocade road, robe and um, I know that some people looked at it a certain way. I really felt that this was a painting that showed intimacy and calm. And um, I did have some conversations with people that had were challenged by it. And again, even though I think he looks stoic, um, there are, are white people who have taken a look at this painting and found that he looks confrontational or they think he looks confident, but they say it in a way that seems threatening. <laughs> So uh, the word confident is a nice word to throw around, but it, there, there are, you know, quotes around them sometimes when I hear people say it. Um, but I love this painting because uh, it's not wrong for me to say I love my own paintings, but I love it because it really took me back to my, my love of, of, of textile design that I spent so much time um, looking at this beautiful pattern and trying to capture it as best as I can. And um, it was a very impactful painting and it meant a lot to a lot of different people. And um, it still continues to leave a mark for a lot of people in different ways, uh, even though it's in a private collection. But again, it's all about the, go, the gaze, um, you know, what, what elevates this? Like, so if people wanted to look at this picture and say, well, it, it's not, about exoticizing, it is a sensual painting, it is a sexual picture. Well, what are the things that elevate it? Is it the pose that elevates it? 
Is it the, the fabric that elevates it? Is it the gaze? You know, I, I really like it when my paintings actually encourage people to think about what we're looking at as opposed to just um, me telling you exactly. I think that painting should elicit or art should elicit questions. And um, they should also uh, encourage the viewer to create their own narratives, to look at the work and look at all the things that are involved in the piece, the gaze, the positioning of the hands, in this case, the cigarette smoke, the, the beautifully ornate robe. And I encourage people to be almost like, almost childlike in getting lost in it and reading into it and creating their own stories while they look at it. Um, so this is where we're now sort of switching gears a little bit. Um, we're going, I, I like to go back and forth in time uh, with regards to my work. Um, I know I'll repeat again that I have these themes that keep going and, and coming and, and changing, but in these conversations that I've had with people about expressions on, my, on the sitters in my paintings, um, I, I've, I've been surprised at the number of times, and I said, and, and I don't want to sound unfair, but predominantly from white viewers, they see some sort of anger in, my, in the characters in my paintings. And I was getting really, really, really frustrated. Like some people have said, this guy looks angry. I think he looks kind of sleepy, <laughs> but apparently sleepy black men look angry to some people. Um, I, again, I, I shouldn't I shouldn't laugh because I said I encourage people to have their own points of view, and but I am surprised when it turns to anger um, because that is the last thing on my mind when I'm painting a lot of these. But it did spur me on to start thinking. Well, if I'm painting paintings where people are seeing anger in faces that I think are stoic, I should do some paintings where there are emotions showing where you don't really see their faces. And so I decided to take on an, I, um, like an iconic piece of clothing. And so I started doing a series of hoodie paintings. So using the hoodie um, was a very, uh, very, it, it really opened the door to a lot of conversations. Um, and I'll just show you the paintings now and we can talk a little bit about the hoodie. So um, I know that I have many different people uh, that are listening from different, who are born at different times. <laughs> but in 2012, uh, Trayvon Martin was a young black man that was gunned down in a community in the States um, and by a vigilante who thought he was dangerous. And one of the things that the, uh, uh, I forget the man's first name, uh, Zimmerman, um, said was that he, this person that he was seeing was wearing a hoodie. And so there's been a lot of discussion since about hoodies and what they represent. But right now, I just want to talk a little bit about this. So I did use the hoodies to, to show different sort of emotional responses where I didn't really want a lot of the face to be shown. I wanted it to be represented through color, through positioning, through texture. And I think this was a really good way of addressing this idea of emotion. And I think one of the reasons why I did this, this was like a subset of a show that I did that was called Visceral. And I did two series, one where people were visibly showing how they felt about racism, whether it was microaggressions or macroaggressions, um, and one where you couldn't see their actual faces, but it was represented through their physicality and through this hoodie. Um, and so this was a, a redemptive feeling for me to sort of create these extreme moods and expressions um, without really showing faces, but also using the hoodie as part of the narrative here, because when uh, by choosing to, to dress them in hoodies, yes, I'm obscuring their faces, but also because it's become such an important and contentious piece of clothing in North American culture. And I can't even say just North American, I should say Western culture. Um, I know young black men who will refuse to wear hoodies. And this is like one of my, one of my friends in England, he's, he's, he's British. And he said he stopped wearing hoodies in high school because he didn't like how he was being treated as a black man wearing a hoodie. And it's, it's something so innocent as a piece of clothing somehow gets uh, changed. It's like alchemy, <laughs> you know, somehow a piece of clothing on a black person changes how people perceive them. 
And so I became focused on doing a lot of work on the hood with hoodie paintings um, because um, they are just such loaded symbolism uh, for a lot of people. There are people, as soon as they see like any one of my hoodie paintings, the first thing they say is Trayvon Martin. Um, but you know, I had some really interesting responses when I started doing my hoodie paintings, uh, CBC Art, uh, Arts did a little video, a little interview video with me, and it talked about the hoodies and what it represented. And I foolishly read the comments underneath a posting of my video on, I think it was on Facebook at the time. And, you know, people were saying, well, people should dress the way they want to be treated. And so people were actually supporting <laughs> the argument that I was trying to discuss is that people will look at someone by how they're dressed and treat them badly. In the same thread, someone's like, well, I go jogging in really nice hoodies. I don't understand why anyone would be treated differently. And so again, it was someone who was talking about buying hoodies at like, I don't know, like at a running room or something. And they didn't understand, they couldn't differentiate or they were saying that there was no difference between buying like, you know, a high-end hoodie versus someone wearing one in an, you know, who maybe couldn't afford one that was as recognizably expensive. Um, and so it, I would advise anybody to never read the comments under your postings <laughs> because it can be really, really disheartening. But it was really informative for me. Um, it really showed me that people weren't really listening to the message and that they were actually proving my point. That some people felt that if you wore a certain type of clothing, then you deserve to be treated that way. But we all know that hoodies are like an essential part of some people's clothing. It's like, you know, what is your uniform? What do we all wear every day? A lot of times, like a lot of people that I've spoken to since I started doing this, they talk about how a hoodie makes them feel um, secure. A hoodie makes them feel confident. A hoodie makes them feel invisible. Um, so some people put on their hoodie because it's something that they can retreat into um, and just sort of feel lost in. I think uh, a hoodie feels like a hug, <laughs> to be quite honest. I really enjoy wearing a hoodie and I never wore hoodies for most of my life. Now I have all these hoodies. Um, but it's, it's interesting how, you know, for some people they say a hoodie, their hoodie is their armor. They put it on and it makes them feel so strong. And so we have to acknowledge that clothing really does have an impact on our own psychology, our own psyche, and it definitely does impact how other people see us. Um, so I did a, a couple more hoodie paintings. I need to move on a little quicker now, but the one on the left with this, the camo, I do a lot of camo in my artwork because I think it's an incredible pattern and I use it all the time. Um, but this one in particular, I don't know if you can see, there's a figure hidden in there. And this, this is a painting that is really personal to me because with the idea of wearing camo, when we think of it as a black man wearing camo, black people tend to stand out more in camo. than if, So, it, you know, the idea of camouflage is trying to take you away, but the work that I do talks about how it actually can draw the eye to the wearer. But I also have embedded in here a basketball player. And so to me, for me, this was like a really personal piece because it's the idea that people can see me as a tall black man or as a tall black boy when I was younger and all they saw, no matter what else was going around, was a basketball player and what it represented to them. So um, I think when we look at, uh, and this one also speaks to me too, because as I said, my background is in, in textile design. So I really love being able to play with the pattern. Um, we look at body language, we talk about the, the posturing of people and how that makes a different significance in the paintings. So, you know, if we look at this painting here, if the viewer is not even gazing and the viewer is able to interpret however they want to, whatever's, you know, what they think is going on in the painting. I'm just gonna move a little quickly. Um, I've included a couple of pictures here, uh, which talks about looking at historical products. This is called Negro powder. It was a cleansing powder. Uh, the idea is that this young man here is wearing his uniform, he's cleaning and is showing the strength of this powder. And I turned it into Negro Power and I converted the painting, I changed the painting. It's about uh, owning it as something positive. I wanna say reclaiming it because this image was something that we would never have created ourselves. And the interesting thing about this and the reason why I included it in this is because the sitter in this painting is actually um, inspired by this person. This is an enslaved man. Uh, I think this picture is from the early 1900s. 
and it shows the keloids. His name is actually, if you Google Gordon the Slave, this is what comes up. And these are, show his scars. And so I wanted to do something that gave him back some semblance of dignity by putting him in a shirt and showing something that represents his own strength. So, which brings us to this painting. Um, as I said, I love to explore history. And so I started learning about the Black Loyalists. The Black Loyalists were enslaved men in the US who were uh, promised freedom by the British if they fought uh, against the Americans in the Revolutionary War. Um, this picture here uh, was the first of my Black Loyalists. And again, it's this idea of playing with the idea of a uniform history, but also embracing um, the hair that he wouldn't have been able to, to wear the way he liked, uh, given the historical context. Which led me to this next painting. And this is a painting that um, has a lot going on. Um, he, this gentleman is actually wearing two uniforms. The learning more about the Black Loyalists really made me start thinking more and more about the idea of, of how Black bodies are used, have been used historically and are used to this day um, for the, you know, uh, how they're used in, in a way that other people can maybe benefit from. And so, you know, I'm looking at him as a soldier by having him in his British jacket, but I also have him as a basketball player wearing a basketball jersey and we're holding a cravat and wearing an, an old style shirt. And the idea that some people might contrast with and saying, well, a basketball player is being paid and he's successful. Uh, however, when professional athletes speak up about political issues, they are told to stop talking. They are told to shut up. And so even with the success of being a professional ball player, you don't necessarily have the freedoms that you think would come with it, or people try to deny you those freedoms. The uniform that he's wearing of the Black Loyalists is a similar sort of situation. If you don't know the history of the Black Loyalists, I encourage you to look it up. But as I said, they were promised freedom by the Brits. And in Canada, there's an area in Canada in Nova Scotia near Halifax called um, Africville, where a lot of the Black Loyalists settled. And um, well, when you make a deal with the devil, <laughs> it doesn't always pay off. So it was not the promised land. Um, and um, the land was actually also taken away from the Mi'kmaq people. There's a lot of things wrong with the story, um, but it didn't end up um, being a situation where people fought and uh, attained the dignity and the, the lifestyle that they thought they would. Um, it ended up becoming, uh, for lack of a better word, well, it was underserviced by the community and it became a pretty nasty place to live or a challenging place to live. And so um, again, it's this idea of the promises that we receive by fighting or by joining or participating. These are things that when we look at um, the promises that made to black people that you can make what's quote unquote the right choices, but the payoff isn't always what you expect it to be or it's not what you were promised. And um, that informed my most recent show, which Mark, and one of the things I, one of the reasons why I also want to show you this is that I also have, um, I frame a lot of my paintings in, uh, in, in old frames. So often I end up using old mirrors, but, um, and using the frames. And this one I absolutely love. It's so ornate and so detailed, but if you look at it, it's broken, it's damaged. And so my paintings, um, this kind of gives them this idea of, of being placed in history, almost like found objects in a way, because they have these historically damaged paintings, but it also um, finishes them in a way that gives importance to the subject that's happening inside of it. Um, let's just take a look at this one here. So this is from my most recent show where I had the pleasure of seeing Mark. Uh, he came and attended it. And this is the continuation of my um, Black Loyalist series. Um, and if we look at them, they 
are very similar upon first glance. It's three different men, but then you start to notice subtle differences. You notice that the numbers on the basketball jerseys are different. And you might notice that the person with the 82 jersey has a sort of a more elaborate necktie. And so even though they're all wearing very, very similar uniforms, you'll also notice that this gentleman, you can actually see his cuffs, his hands on this one. So what I was hoping to do with this is tell a story. These st portraits are called, um, oh my goodness, I just blanked that on the first one. Dra draft pick, I use sports terms. This is draft pick. So this is like the first round of, and so the year 75, the numbers on the shirts represent the years. Uh, so 1775, um, he would have been, you know, draft pick first round chosen. He's young. There's a bit of movement to his, the tassels on his epaulettes. His hair is moving a little bit. 79 is the new recruit. So 79 in that year was the year that um, when, when black people were first, you know, drafted into this army against the Americans, um, the revolutionaries, they were not actually entrusted with weapons or given uniforms. So the black loyalists originally were given shovels and told to dig ditches and were given menial tasks. And as the Brits realized they were losing the war towards uh, 79, they actually started giving them weapons. They actually started expanding their army, including more people and giving and entrusting the formerly enslaved with weapons. And then 82 was the end of the war when the Brits conceded that they lost. And so I wanted to represent in this last painting um, here that he's showing that he's free, his hands are free. And so you can't see the hands in the other two. You can imagine there is no shackles, but I, I like how the cuffs or the gauntlets of his arms look like shackles that have broken free. And he's wearing his finest clothes because he's moving on to the uh, expectation of of freedom. And so he's done his tie in a celebratory way. Um, as Mark mentioned, this last painting, which is called Trade, um, has been acquired by the Art Gallery of Hamilton. And I just had the pleasure of seeing it in situ this past weekend. And that was a pretty marvelous moment um, for me and my partner and, and gallery. Um, I know I'm running out of time, but my last few paintings here uh, also talk about this idea of professional athletes and how the expectation of um, when we have these people that were held to hire, uh, we hold up high as leaders when the pandemic hit and, um, um, you know, in 2020, when we all saw George Floyd get murdered, it was an interesting turning point in, in the world because we saw that as some people spoke up, um, especially prominent ones, and uh, we looked, we heard a lot of people telling them that they had no right to speak up. And so I did this series with the masks to represent the idea that the masks were equipment that we were supposed to be using to keep us safe. But um, even as athletes, so uh, I, I wanted to show that there were people who were still being muted, being muffled, and who were being suffocated because they couldn't communicate what they wanted to or get what they needed to survive. And so I included this because um, I think it's a really poignant series of work, but I also wanted to show that um, art can have a very, art and, and style and however we wanna phrase it can also have a very important part in how we speak up and acknowledge what's going on in the world around us. Uh, this, these series of paintings, um, this series of paintings was actually really important to me because it was also one of the few times as an artist that I responded uh, directly to what was currently happening in the world. Um, a lot of the narratives that I do are things that I have worked on of personal interests um, that I've developed over time. Uh, but this was an opportunity for to express myself and um, find a way to uh, acknowledge what was going on and speak up about it uh, through my art. Um, I know this was a lot of information and I've covered a lot of stuff. Uh, I just want to go back. Um, ultimately, though, um, I think what I've learned is um, 
that we spend a lot of time choosing how we want to style ourselves and how we want to present ourselves to the world. I've spent my entire life uh, focusing on something. And in the last five years, I've learned so much either through art or through my own personal experiences or through meeting younger people who are emerging artists that the narratives that we create for ourselves are personal, they're strong, and they're often well-intentioned. And we need to stick to our core beliefs in order to move forward as a society. Um, and we don't need to let in the people who, <laughs> um, who try to tear us down because if we don't continue to move forward and if we don't continue to uh, fight to hear, have our voices heard the way we want to have them heard, no matter how we choose to express them, um, then they're going to win and they shouldn't win. So let's all just keep fighting the good fight. And that's what I'd like to say for today. And that's the end of my presentation. Well, thank you, Gordon. That was 